Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. To anyone who may be tuning into this short video or passing by, welcome. Also, I'm just giving a quick update on what I did last week. So last week I travelled down to Oxford University to talk to some of the students there about the Islamic mystical tradition. Uh, they had invited me to talk about whether the initiatory tales that we find in certain parts of the Islamic tradition can still be relevant today in our daily lives. And so I'm just going to give a summary of what I talked about last week because I thought it might be useful for anyone who's also listening in or also anyone who wasn't able to attend at that time. So when we're talking about the initiatory tales that we find in the Islamic tradition, what we are really referring to are the what are called Dastan Hayya Safar in Nafs or stories of the journey of the soul and these feature in the work of Ibn Sina, Ibn Tufail and Shihabuddin Sohravardi. So Ibn Tufail and Sohravardi both saw themselves as improving on the work of Ibn Sina or improving upon one or two of Ibn Sina's initiatory tales and this is because in Ibn Sina's work, there was still quite an Aristotelian influence, Akka, uh, otherwise known as a rationalist influence in the narrative. And so, at least with Sohravardi, he saw his initiatory tales as being a corrective to Ibn Sina's initiatory tales. In particular, Ibn Sina's story of Hay Ibn Yaqthan where the protagonist goes on a journey into the self and essentially encounters the senses, both the outer and the inner senses, that make up the human being. And his narrative stops just when he meets the initiating sage called Hay ibn Yaqdan, or living son of the awake, and the sage says to him that now that the protagonist has journeyed through all of these different levels of the human being, including the outer and the inner senses, Hayab and Yaqdan is now going to take him on a journey towards a direct encounter with reality, or al-haqiqa. But Ibn Sina's narrative stops short of Hayab and Yaqdan saying to the protagonist, now I'm going to take you on this journey. And Shihabuddin Sohravardi's commentary on Ibn Sina's tale was that, as he says, Ibn Sina had not conveyed the most important part of the soul's journey in this story, which is what Sohravardi calls the calamity, or we could call it an ecstatic encounter with the divine. As we know in the Islamic mystical tradition, Shihabuddin Sohravardi is said to have been the founder of the Ishraqi tradition or the Ishraqi school, the school of illumination. And he was said to be influenced or to have some kind of direct form of inspiration. Initially, he said from a dream that he had about Aristotle, where Aristotle basically says, I got it wrong and Plato was right and that Plato or Plato's method is actually the method of true philosophy, the correct way to philosophy or the correct way to knowing reality. So Shihabuddin Sohravardi saw himself as having two lineages in a sense, the Abrahamic lineage and the Iranian lineage, uh, because what he was focusing on was the transmission of esoteric knowledge how this is transmitted, some people say uh, from from one heart to the next or one consciousness to the next. And he ends these two lines, the Abrahamic line and the Iranian line or Persian line, however anyone wants to say it. He ends with Bayezid Bastami and Mansur al-Halaj. And then he says that he is an inheritor of Bayezid Bastami and Mansur al-Halaj. With regard to the work of Ibn Tufail, 
So this again is another tale that is called Hay ibn Yaqdhan, but in this case Hay ibn Yaqdhan is the protagonist in the tale and it's a very famous narrative. You can probably find a lot of information about it already just on Google or YouTube. But when you analyze the content of Ibn Tufail's story, if we're looking at it from an imami perspective, a couple of things stand out. Number one is that his theory of coming to know the one or coming to have a direct encounter with the divine is again heavily influenced by the Aristotelian stroke platonic philosophy. And another thing about Ibn Tufel is that the way he talks about Walaya is um, it, it's the way that mystics of the Sunni tradition started to talk about Walaya in a sense that Walaya is a spiritual station that anyone can attain. But the thing about the Sunni Sufi conception of Walaya, as I have said in my work in the past, is that while technically in the Imami tradition, it is possible to attain a station that is very close to that of an Imam without having the role or the function of an Imam. At the same time, Walaya in the Imami tradition is not seen as a spiritual station that you can attain. This idea that Walaya is a spiritual station that you can attain entered somehow into the Sunni Sufi tradition. In the Imami tradition, we could say that Walaya is a phenomenon. It's a spiritual phenomenon that exists between God and the Ahlul Bayt, the, fa the, the Holy Prophet and his family, and the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, or the followers of the Holy Prophet and his family. So, Walaya is not a station, it's more of a, it's a relationship. Walaya is a relationship, it's a sacred relationship that exists, and the quality of that relationship depends upon the practice of the follower of the Ahlul Bayt, depends upon the conduct of the follower. Yes, there may be different levels to this relationship depending upon the actions of the follower of the Ahlul Bayt. So yes, you can have a better quality of Walaya with God and the Ahlul Bayt, you know, depending upon your own struggle with the self and the internal spiritual level that you may attain. But Walaya per se is not a spiritual station in the Imami school. So this is where it differs, for example, from the work of Ibn Tufel, where again, he talks about Walaya as a station that can be attained. So uh, another difference obviously between Ibn Tufel's work and the path towards an encounter with the divine in the school of Ahlul Bayt is that in the school of Ahlul Bayt, alayhum salam, because Walaya is a central and fundamental part of the path, then the connection to the Ahlul Bayt, alayhum salam, meaning the Holy Prophet and the rest of the infallibles, that relationship is fundamental to a correct path to the one or correct path to the divine. So as the scholars explain, within the Imami tradition, the Imam is the Ayatul Kubra, the greatest sign by means of which God reveals himself. And just as the Quran commands us to contemplate the signs of God in creation, likewise, the Imam is also a sign from God that we are meant to reflect upon, to contemplate, and attain ma'rifah of. And so this is like we could say the key difference between the imami path to esoteric knowledge and the non-imami path to esoteric knowledge. Of course there is the debate as to whether just because there are other paths to the divine that do not involve an encounter with the imam, does that make them any less valid than the path that we take through the esoteric dimensions of the imam? Does that make them any less valid a means of knowing the one? And it could be argued that because Islam declares itself as a corrective 
of, or the Quran declares itself as a corrective of previous paths, then it could be argued that likewise the, the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt are corrective even of the paths that were laid out by Aristotle and Plato. So then the question would arise, why are you turning to Aristotle and Plato, who uh, obviously came before Islam, if Islam has come to correct the method of encountering the divine? or encountering the divine to the extent that the divine permits itself to be witnessed or to be known. So this is the issue that I have with Ibn Tufail's work. Another issue that I noticed in his work is that he does refer to this quite common practice that quite a lot of the people aspiring to be Arafat used to engage in, and this is the practice of extended periods in a dark room. In other words, uh, the practice of sensory deprivation, and uh, this has been practiced by numerous orders, Sunni Sufi orders. It was also practiced by Jalaluddin Rumi's Mevlevi order also. One thing about this practice of extended sensory deprivation is that it can lead to psychosis. It can lead to permanent psychological damage. And so it could be argued that it's a problematic method of training of the self in order to encounter the divine. It could be said this is why we don't really find it in the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, at least not in the texts of the Ahlul Bayt. I mean, there isn't really even a hint of it. There have been, as far as I know, no instructions from the Ahlul Bayt to have extended periods in a dark room or in a cupboard or buried in the earth, you know, in a, in a cellar in the earth, which is what a lot of the people aspiring to become Arafat uh, did engage in in the later centuries, we could say, 10th, 11th century onwards. So that is a few issues with Ibn Tufail. And then with regard to obviously Shihabuddin Sarvardi, whose Ishraqi school, his school of illumination, went on to influence what then became known as the school of Isfahan and was very influential in Iran and maybe a little bit in India. That's arguable the extent to which he became influential in India. But Okay, I mean, the work of Shehabuddin Savardi is interesting, it's very nice, but unless you have really researched the Neoplatonic influences upon the Ishraqi school, then some of the content of Saravardi, number one, you're going to think that it's original content, and also you're not going to realise that what has shaped his thought is, for example, the work of Plotinus. When you're reading the work of Plotinus, namely his book, the Aeneids, it sometimes take a takes a little bit of uh, analysis to work out, obviously because our thinking has been trained in the Islamic tradition. So in the Islamic tradition, there's basically the one, which is Allah, and then arguably there is the Logos or the word, which is the, or the Aql, the intellect, or the Qalam, the pen. All of these refer to the same thing, which is the first creation of God. God's first creation, which is the Muhammadan light, Al-Nur Muhammadi, otherwise known as the Qalam, the pen, otherwise known as the Aql or the intellect. And as I said, this is a creation of God, whereas we see in the Platonic tradition that the Logos is often the first emanation from the One. And perhaps we can talk about creation and emanation in another video. So yes, Shihabuddin Sohravardi uh, when you actually compare some of his work to the work of Plotinus, then you can see that it's kind of almost like a reworking of Plotinus. Of course, Sohravardi did say that he's an inheritor of the work of Plato, or he's an inheritor of the method of Plato. But again, like I said, the whole point of the coming of Islam was to offer to humanity a holistic method towards knowing the divine. I do personally find that uh, Platonic and Neoplatonic influenced spirituality that has come into the Islamic mystical tradition, at least through the texts that have come down to us, is quite idealistic. Even within Neoplatonic works, we see a different concept of the material 
world from what we find in Islam. So in the Platonic tradition, the material realm per se is corrupt. The material realm is a place where we don't want to be and that or the soul doesn't want to be and that the soul longs to be free of the material realm in order to go back to its original immaterial state. And so this kind of sets up a whole, a whole method within the mind of the seeker. It sets up a whole concept of reality. Uh, it sets up a whole concept of, a whole conception of what we are doing here in the world and how we relate to the world. And this is my issue with the Platonic dash Neoplatonic tradition, is that it sets up an attitude of the seeker towards creation. In the Islamic tradition, the creation is something beautiful by means of which we are to obtain wisdom. Of course, the creation or, or our time in the creation is a short time. Human life is ephemeral. But the creation itself, material world itself, is not in itself corrupt. And this is the fundamental difference between the Platonic tradition and the Islamic tradition. And of course, this will then have a knock-on effect on how you relate to the material world and how you cultivate your spirituality within the material world as well. The Quran does talk about dunya, it does talk about the world, or dunya meaning that which is near. And yes, it does say that the things of the dunya, such as children, wealth, vehicles, what we would call vehicles today, but back then it was, for example, horses, and the fine things of the dunya, in essence, don't really have any meaning because uh, or else they're even sent to test us because they are things that we are going to leave behind when we leave this world. So yes, the material world itself is not corrupt. Dunya itself does contain corruption. But reflecting upon what is said about the dunya in the hadith, I've kind of come to the conclusion that what is meant by dunya is human society. And so dunya is human society, which is different from the material world or creation, which is something beautiful and full of gifts and blessings that we don't appreciate in this world. So these are a few of my thoughts from my research and from all of these years of reflection. I hope that this video might have had some use for you. And inshallah, I will be discussing more of this in future videos. So thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum.